pile the bodies high at Austerlitz and Waterloo. Shovel them under and let me work. I am the grass, I cover all. And pile them high at Gettysburg, and pile them high at Ypres and Verdun. Shovel them under and let me work. Two years, ten years, and passengers ask the conductor, What place is this? Where are we now? I am the grass. Let me work. Humanity has always turned to poetry as the most perfect means of expression. The aim of the poet is to distill our most basic emotions down to a few highly expressive phrases, using words sparingly in a very precise form to capture the feeling of a moment or of an age. Poetry is one of the most powerful means of communication. Within its many forms, poetry tells stories, defines emotions, encapsulates both joy and despair. War poetry is one of the foremost examples of this most human of expressions. It has been an integral part of human experience since the beginning of time. At their best, war poems define the era in which the poet lived and died. And many have come down to us as startling testaments of the spirit of the age in which they were written. One of the earliest in the English tradition concerns a battle between the Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings. At Malden in Essex, a small army of East Saxons, led by Britneth, were cut down by Norse invaders during the summer of 991 AD. This minor episode in our history would have probably passed with little comment had not a poet turned this one single incident into the subject for an epic poem. Uh, the poem, The Battle of Malden, is mainly a narrative of the events of that day, uh, but the last section distills the very essence of the heroic attitude to war during the Dark Ages and the early Middle Ages. Uh, Britvold, the aging champion who fought at the side of Britnoth, witnessed the death of his lord. In the face of certain defeat, he encouraged his companions with some genuinely immortal lines. Brithwald grasped his shield and spoke. He was an old companion. He brandished his ash spear and with wonderful courage exhorted the warriors. Mind must be firmer, courage the greater, heart the more fierce as our strength diminishes. Here lies our leader dead, a heroic man in the dust. He who now longs to escape will lament forever. I am old. I will not go from here, but I mean to lie by the side of my lord, lie in the dust with the man I loved so dearly. That's the quintessential expression of the Old English, the Anglo-Saxon heroic code. But the American poet Robert Frost uh, once said that poetry is what gets lost in translation. And what the Anglo-Saxon poet really said was something like, like, like this. Beertwold Martheloda bore the half an odor, say was eald geniat, asher waiter, heiful baldliche, bayornus leader, higa shall the headra, he orta the kenra, mod shall the mara, the ur megan litla. As I think you can hear, Anglo-Saxon is a very gritty, muscular language, uh, much more sinewy than ours, much simpler than ours. But we're left with a problem. How does the poet know all this? Because if this band are cut down to the last man, who tells us the story? Well, he clearly can't have been one with the cowards who ran off early because 
the heart of the poem is what happens after the cowards have bolted. And the, the, the belief is, most scholars, I think, now reckon that the poet was actually present at the battle because in Anglo-Saxon society, poets were expected to take their place in the shield wall and to fight in the battle. However, they were not expected to fight to the death because their duty was to recall the exploits of the heroes so that their glory should be increased. Anglo-Saxon heroes lived for glory. That was what was important. So we think that this poet um, took his place in the shield wall and at the last minute um, withdrew. Um, and that would follow the pattern of another famous old English battle poem, or rather an old Welsh battle poem, called the Godothin, at the end of which we are told this, if I can find it. 363 gold-talked men of all those who charged after too much drink, but three won free through courage and strife. Aaron's two warhounds and tough Sinon, and myself soaked in blood for my song's sake. The poet, soaked in blood for his song's sake, is able to leave the battle at the end. Throughout the centuries, the nature of war poetry has changed and evolved. A verse was used as a means of spreading news or recounting history and of educating generations about past deeds of valour. Uh, but modern poets need not recount the deeds of their fellow combatants. We have war correspondents to do that. Every day the news is blooded by war from some corner of the world. Today poetry from the battlefield is about stark emotions. It is about what it feels like to kill, to dodge bullets, or to stand and watch helpless as the familiar, miserable scenes of destruction and violence are played out in Vietnam or Yugoslavia. In our own time, the tortured words of the First World War poets echo across the generations and have come to define for many people the whole genre. On the surface, no rational man could find glory in the squalor of the Somme or Passchendaele, but many did, and the war poets were among them. In many ways, the anti-war sentiments which found articulate expression in the verses of poets like Wilfred Owen and Siegfried Sassoon were the exception rather than the rule. Of course, great war poetry has been written since 1918. The Spanish Civil War and World War II and Vietnam have all produced beautiful and moving work, but somehow uh, the desolate images from the war to end all wars are indelibly stamped on our consciousness. Of course, there were many stops en route in the development of poetry from Malden to the trenches of the Somme. However, poetry remained primarily a narrative vehicle. Uh, throughout the medieval and Tudor periods, poetry was used chiefly as a means of recording the events themselves, rather than the emotions and consequences. It was not until around the time of the English Civil War that we first began to see poets beginning to adapt their craft for other purposes. The English Revolution began in 1642, for many of the participants, war was a noble occupation which had long been linked with the arts. A soldier now could be both poet and warrior, serving his lord equally with both skills. These romantic cavalier poets saw war as another way of gaining enriched experience. They were searching constantly for the ultimate romantic moment a heightened experience of great emotional intensity which some thought could be found only on the battlefield. Richard Lovelace was a dashing cavalier, often described as the embodiment of all that made the soldier poets of the time famous. In 1642, Lovelace was chosen by the Royalists to read a Royalist petition to a hostile House of Commons. For his pains, he was put into jail, where he wrote his famous poem to Althea from prison. Stone walls do not a prison make, nor iron bars a cage. Minds innocent and quiet take that for a hermitage. 
for I have freedom in my love, and in my soul am free. Angels alone that soar above enjoy such liberty. For the first time, we are hearing the work of a war poet which is almost exclusively concerned with emotions rather than action. Uh, no record exists of Lovelace's limited military career, so he probably did not achieve the martial glory he sought. But he did leave us a second beautiful work which entwines the themes of love, duty and faithfulness. Tell me not, sweet, I am unkind, that from the nunnery of thy chaste breast and quiet mind to war and arms I fly. True, a new mistress now I chase, the first foe in the field, and with a stronger faith embrace a sword, a horse, a shield. Yet this inconstancy is such as you too shall adore. I could not love thee dear so much, loved I not honour more. The chivalric tradition transmuted into the courtly tradition of the High Renaissance required proficiency in the arts of war as well as in more peaceable arts such as poetry and music. The courtier poet was expected to serve his king just as the old English poet was expected to take his place in the shield wall with the troops. So the, the poets of the uh, 16th, 17th centuries, many of them had also seen combat and some of them wrote poems about it. Um, uh, Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, has left a very moving elegy to his squire who once saved him in a battle. John Donne encapsulated his experience at Cadiz in, in a little poem. But what is surprising to us today, at a time when many poets write war poems who've never been in a battle, is that so many of these poets who had experience of war write so little about it. War was now was no longer the subject for poetry. Love was the, the subject for poetry. Paradoxically, the convention that announced, proclaimed the subject of war as too gross for the polite art of poetry, uh, permitted, even required, select use of military terminology in the language of the love poem. Cupid, after all, is an archer. The besieging lover, having no proof against Cupid's darts, can only pray his lady that, in a spirit of Christian compassion, she will uh, surrender to him. I said a select use of military terminology. Select in that one very important word is hardly ever mentioned, gunpowder. Gunpowder had already transformed uh, the nature of warfare, but was considered too gross a term uh, to enter the polite world of poetry. With the fall of the Cavaliers and their replacement by the Puritans, uh, the style of military poetry seems to have undergone a similar rude change. The new ruler of England was Oliver Cromwell. In that capacity, he commanded expeditions to subdue both Ireland and Scotland. Uh, the classical style of Marvel's poetry is in direct contrast to the romantic style of Lovelace. Uh, gone are the illusions to love and romanticism. The poetry is more functional in keeping with the prevalent Puritan sympathies. The poem examines Cromwell's motives for making war. Uh, Marvel, therefore, was one of the first poets to use verse as a means of explaining and understanding the causes rather than the events of a war. Andrew Marvel wrote this ode to the great man. So restless Cromwell could not cease in the inglorious arts of peace, but through adventurous war urged his active star. And like the three-forked lightning, first breaking the clouds where it was nursed, bid through his own side his fiery way divide. But thou, the wars and fortune's son, march indefatigably on, and for the last effect still kept thy sword erect. Besides the force it has to fright, the spirits of the shady night, the same arts that did gain a power, must it maintain. Britain entered the 18th century in great pomp and glory, expanding its influence around the world, chiefly through commerce and a strong maritime force, 
the British Empire was being formed. Against this background of pride and patriotism, a Scottish poet called James Thompson penned a note, which embodied the British patriotic feelings of the day. For the first time, war poetry could be harnessed to further the aims of the expanding British state. Jingoistic as well as patriotic, the poetry of the 18th century was very much a product of the age. The victims of Britain's expansion, both at home and abroad, did not merit a mention. The poetry is striking, but it is ultimately heartless, seeking only glory, not understanding. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries from History Hit and uncover the secrets of some of the most famous people and events in history. History Hit gives you access to a growing range of documentaries presented by and featuring historians at the forefront of research and debate. Whether you are looking to find out more about charismatic leaders like Cleopatra or to discover the story behind the Industrial Revolution, History Hit will have something for you. We also aim to bring you the stories and legends that shaped our world through our award-winning podcast network. Sign up now for a free trial and Absolute History fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY at checkout. When Britain first at heaven's command arose from the azure main, this was the charter of the land, and guardian angels sung this strain. Rule Britannia, rule the waves. Britons never will be slaves. The nations not so blessed as thee must in their turns to tyrants fall, while thou shall flourish great and free, the dread and envy of them all. Rule Britannia, rule the waves. Britons never will be slaves. Despite the prevailing mood of national euphoria, another far more famous and revered Scot dared to express the human cost of war. He was Robert Burns, a poet with a great feeling for universal man, for love and humanity. Against the grain of the times in which he lived, he penned a short but precise poem which carries a direct and powerful message in a few brief lines, one of the first anti-war poems. Ye hypocrites! Are these your pranks? To murder men and give God thanks. Desist for shame! Proceed no further! God won't accept your thanks for murder. Burns was not intimidated by the jingoistic and nationalistic fervour that was sweeping the British Isles. He was not afraid to see through the vainglorious swagger and tell the truth. Nonetheless, he accepted the need for war on occasions, but he could not accept the pomp and circumstance of a national celebration for an act which had cost men's lives. Burns was a complex man, who undoubtedly ranks as one of the greatest literary figures Britain has ever produced. His work is overflowing with the contradictions and paradoxes which are found in all of us. He was capable of writing moving poetry celebrating martial acts, uh, such as the great victory won by Bruce at Bannockburn. But his enduring quality is that he never lost sight of the human cost of war, and he possessed the unerring ability to sweep away the pretenses of militarism. Of course, being Burns, he would always present a practical alternative. I murder hate by field of flood. Though glory's name is Greeners, it's wars at him I'll spend my blood. Life-giving wars are Venus. The deities that I adore are social peace and plenty. I'm better pleased to make one more than be the death of twenty. In Britain, there were all too few poets of his time with the same earthy honesty as Burns. But in Europe, a movement of which he would have approved was beginning to take shape. The continental poets turned their thoughts to opposing war far earlier than the British. Victor Hugo, the French poet, dramatist and novelist, was a practised exponent of the art of writing about great human tragedy. His novels, The Hunchback of Notre Dame and Les Miserables, 
are enduring classics of 19th century romantic literature. Hugo's father was an officer in the Imperial Army and travelled constantly across the continent, following in the wake of Napoleon. Those experiences made their mark on the young writer. Hugo grew into a fierce opponent of war and oppression, and Russia 1812 is one of his most heartfelt works. In hollows, where the snow was piling up, one saw whole regiments fallen asleep. Attila's dawn, canais of Hannibal, the army marching to its funeral. Litters, wounded, the dead, deserters swarm, crushing the bridges down to cross a stream. They went to sleep ten thousand, woke up four. Nay, bringing up the former army's rear, hacked his horse loose from three disputing Cossacks. All night, the qui vivre, the alert, attacks, retreats. White ghosts would wrench away our guns, or we would see dim, terrible squadrons, circles of steel, whirlpools of savages, rush sabering through the camp like dervishes. And in this way, Whole armies died at night. Victor Hugo was a 19th century novelist as well as a poet, writing in France long after the novel had superseded the poem as the principal literary form. The 18th century had seen the birth of the novel, a century in which soldiering reached the low place in British society that it would hold until the Great War an occupation regarded by the middle and working classes as a disgrace almost as bad as prison. If an 18th century British poet wrote of war, which he seldom did so, um, it would be as a remote phenomenon. So the poet John Scott of Amwell declares, I hate that drum's discordant sound, parading round and round and round, to me it talks of ravaged plains, burning towns and ruined swains, and mangled limbs and dying groans, and widows' tears and orphans' moans, and all that misery's hand bestows to fill the catalogue of human woes. As the French Revolution made its contribution to that catalogue, warfare once again became a subject of interest to British poets. Uh, Sir Walter Scott and Thomas Campbell engaged in uh, patriotic outpourings. Coleridge and Wordsworth, on the other hand, hailed the rising orb of liberty. Both of them were disillusioned by the later course of the French Revolution. And in Book Four of Wordsworth's great poem, The Prelude, there's a very moving account of a meeting with a battered veteran of the Napoleonic campaigns. Victor Hugo's anger at the destruction of Napoleon's army is plain. But in England, another equally futile episode in the history of war was depicted in a completely different way. As European poets moved towards a real appreciation of the nature of war, English poets still thrived on the myth of martial glory, and an eager public hungrily devoured every morsel. Alfred Lord Tennyson became Britain's national poet, with his much-loved Ode on the Death of Wellington in 1852, but he's chiefly remembered for his stirring charge of the Light Brigade. The poem chronicles the heroism of the men who took part in the infamous charge during the Battle of Balaclava at the height of the Crimean War. Published in 1855, the charge of the Light Brigade embodies all that is considered heroic about war and soldiering. The verses echo down the generations, exhorting men of all classes to face the heat of battle with courage and faith. In stark contrast to Hugo, for Tennyson, war is still a noble art, no matter how futile the events may seem. Nonetheless, even by hinting in his poem that the disastrous charge may have been the result of a failure in the high command, 
Tennyson was acting against the grain of a Victorian society where a stiff upper lip was an admirable quality. Here we see Tennyson beginning to subtly alter the role of the poem, from reporting events from the battlefield to questioning the wisdom of such lunacy. Half a league, half a league, half a league, onward! All in the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the light brigade, charge for the guns, he said. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the light brigade! Was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew someone had blundered. There's not to make reply. There's not to reason why. There's but to do and die. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon in front of them, volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell. Boldly they rode and well into the jaws of death into the mouth of hell rode the 600. It's significant that the episode which captured Tennyson's imagination and went on to capture the imagination of tens of thousands of Victorian readers was a cavalry action fought on foreign soil. I say significant because in his own day, Tennyson was known less for the Charge of the Light Brigade than for his great long poem, The Idols of the King, the king being King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. Now, the Victorians, having had no experience of warfare on their own soil, could afford to indulge their nostalgia for things medieval, for dashing knights on horseback, uh, rescuing ladies in distress. The chivalric code was gradually transmuted into that of the Christian gentleman, uh, supposedly a product of the public schools, many of which were being opened at that time. Each school was dominated by its chapel, which suited the Philistine respectability of the devout bourgeois and the curriculum was dominated by Latin and, to a lesser extent, by Greek. In 1884, there were 28 classics masters at Eton, six mathematics masters, one historian, no modern language teachers and no scientists. As late as 1905, classics masters still formed more than half the teaching staff. The poet spokesman for the public schools at the end of the 19th century was Henry Newbolt. The title of his poem, Clifton Chapel, uh, gives a nod to Matthew Arnold's more famous poem, Rugby Chapel. But whereas Arnold, the headmaster's son, is speaking to his father and the noble and great who have gone, Henry Newbolt addresses a new generation of young imperialists. And this is what he says. To set the cause above renown, to love the game beyond the prize, to honour while you strike him down the foe that comes with fearless eyes, to count the life of battle good and dear the land that gave you birth, and dearer yet the brotherhood that binds the brave of all the earth. God send you fortune. Yet be sure among the lights that gleam and pass you'll live to follow none more pure than that which glows on yonder brass. Qui procul hinc, the legend's writ, the frontier grave is far away. Qui anti diem pediit, sed miles, sed pro patria. The Latin meaning, he who lies far from this place died before daybreak, but he was a soldier and he died for his country. In a more famous, or perhaps I want to say a more notorious poem, uh, again with a Latin, uh, Latin, the title being Vitae Lampada, a, taken, a title taken from Lucretius, meaning they pass on the torch of life, Newbolt envisaged the public school ethic at work on a frontier far away. The river of death has brimmed his banks, and England's far and honour a name. But the voice of a schoolboy rallies the ranks. Play up, play up, and play the game. 
Newbolt's repeated celebration of the imperialist officer and gentleman carrying his code to a country's battlefields, a code, a sporting code, learnt on the sports fields of his public school. Across the Atlantic, the young United States of America had long fought to overcome sectional tensions caused by the existence of slavery in the southern states. But the dam burst at Fort Sumter in 1861, and the American Civil War began its bloody progress. Considered by many historians to be the first modern war, almost a million Americans perished in battle or from disease and starvation. The slaughter was not confined to the battlefield either. Millions of civilians suffered both bombardment and siege. The age of total war had dawned. America had more newspapers than anywhere else, and through the new art of photography, the horror of war was communicated all round the continent and the world. Subtly, the kind of poetry written about war began to change. Walt Whitman and Herman Melville captured the feeling of senselessness and futility which came to characterise the poetry of the next great war in 1914. The sheer scale of the conflict left poets almost dumbstruck. I mean, their task was not to describe battle anymore. And many of their readers would even have had first-hand experience of the conflict itself. And the concerns of the poet, therefore, became the emotions stirred by war, the rage, sadness, the loss and futility. Melville tried to capture them all in his haunting poem written in the aftermath of the Battle of Shiloh. Skimming lightly, wheeling still, the swallows fly low over the field in clouded days, the forest field of Shiloh, over the field where April rain solaced the parched ones stretched in pain through the pours of night that followed the Sunday fight around the church of Shiloh, the church so lone, the log-built one, that echoed to many a parting groan and natural prayer of dying foemen mingled there, foemen at morn, but friends at eve, fame or country least their care, what like a bullet can undeceive? But now they lie low, while over them the swallows skim, and all is hushed at Shiloh. Despite the development taking place in America and elsewhere, uh, British war poetry continued largely unchanged. Uh, the British still looked upon war as a glorious occupation. Although Rudyard Kipling uh, wrote within the prevailing patriotic tone of British poetry, he was actually um, doing something rather different. And for the first time, we see a poet begin to question some of the attitudes which made life so miserable for the rank and file. It was Kipling who extended the scope of British war poetry to encompass the concerns of the ordinary working-class soldier. Well, of course, I mean, he did most of the dying in the service of the British Army. Uh, this was a departure of sorts. The common soldier had until now mostly been ignored. He was a uh, mere cannon fodder, it seemed. But uh, Kipling gave voice to some of the concerns seen from the lowly perspective of the ranks. I went into a public house to get a pint of beer. The publican, he up and says, we serve no redcoats here. And the girls behind the bar, they laughed and giggled fit to die. I out into the street again, and to myself says I, oh, it's Tommy this, and Tommy that, and Tommy go away. But it's thank you, Mr. Atkins, when the band begins to play. The band begins to play, my boys. The band begins to play. Oh, it's thank you, Mr. Atkins, when the band begins to play. I, I went into a theatre, as sober as could be. They gave a drunk civilian room, but had none for me. They sent me to the gallery or round the music halls. But when it comes to fighting, Lord, they'll shove me in the stalls. It's Tommy this and Tommy that and Tommy wait outside. Bad. It's special train for Atkins when the trooper's on the tide. The troop ship's on the tide, my boys. The troop ship's on the tide. Oh, it's special train for Atkins when the trooper's on the tide. Since most poetry, apart from popular ballads, is written by people who are literate, 
And since prior to the 19th century, most people who were literate were um, of the richer classes, were noblemen or, or, or gentry. Most poetry, most war poetry, was concerned with the actions of noblemen or gentlemen, officers, knights, and so on. All that changed with the Education Acts of 1870 and 1876, so that the British Army that sailed for South Africa at the start of the Boer War in 1890 was the first literate army in history. And for the first time, large numbers of private soldiers wrote about what was happening to them. They wrote letters home, they kept diaries, and a surprising number wrote poems. Many of the poems sounded like Kipling, who was very popular and who was himself fascinated by soldiers and warfare. Two other notable poets wrote powerfully about the Boer War and contributed to the reappraisal of the private soldier. First of all, there was A.E. Hausman, who had lost a brother in the conflict and whose book, A Shropshire Lad, contains uh, many melancholy romantic poems, uh, like this one called Grenadier. The queen she sent to look for me. The sergeant he did say, Young man, a soldier will you be for thirteen pence a day? For thirteen pence a day did I take off the things I wore, and I have marched to where I lie, and I shall march no more. My mouth is dry, my shirt is wet, my blood runs all away. So now I shall not die in debt for thirteen pence a day. Tomorrow, after new young men, the sergeant he must see, for things will all be over then between the Queen and me. And I shall have to bait my price, for in the grave, they say, is neither knowledge nor device nor thirteen pence a day. This poem is called Drummer Hodge, Hodge being a quintessentially English countryman's name, and it's about a young boy, a drummer, not even a soldier, a musician, who goes to South Africa and stays there. They throw in Drummer Hodge to rest uncoffined, just as found. His landmark is a copy crest that breaks the felt around and foreign constellations west each night above his mound. Young Hodge the drummer never knew, fresh from his Wessex home, the meaning of the broad Karoo, the bush, the dusty loam, and why uprose to nightly view strange stars amid the gloam. Yet portion of that unknown plain will Hodge for ever be. His homely northern breast and brain grow to some southern tree, and strange-eyed constellations rain his stars eternally. So we arrive at the Great War, the war that was supposed to end all wars. Instead, it ushered in a century of unprecedented destruction and death. The poets who fought and died in this war transformed their art into the genre we know today. War poetry will become a means of mental opposition, as idealistic young men like Wilfred Owen and Isaac Rosenberg experienced the horrors of the trenches. It was their emotional reaction to the slaughter which would turn verse into a weapon for understanding and sanity. Of course, when the war began, many still thought they'd find glory in France like Rupert Brooke. If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. There shall be in that rich earth a richer dust concealed, a dust whom England bore, shaped, made aware, gave once her flowers to love, her ways to roam, a body of England's breathing English air, washed by the rivers, blessed by sons of home. 
Brooke was a sportsman and scholar with dashing good looks and a classical education. He went to war seeking, as the soldier suggests, heroic fulfillment, but tragically he found instead an early and inglorious death. Sailing to the ill-fated Dardanelles, Brooke died of septicemia on a hospital ship and was buried in an olive grove on the Greek island of Skiros. He had probably envisaged a more noble death than this, but now he was to join the ranks of those whom he sought to immortalise. Blow out your bugles over the rich dead. There's none of these so lonely and so poor of old, but dying has made us rarer gifts than gold. These laid the world away, poured out the red sweet wine of youth, gave up the years to be of work and joy, and that unhoped serene that men call age, and those who would have been their sons, they gave their immortality. The full horror of the trenches soon began to surface in the poetry written at the front, and the honourable sentiments that inspired the work of Rupert Brooke were soon to dissipate under the weight of reality. Before it did so, the genre was to produce other fine examples of war poetry written in a stirring, martial manner. The work of Julian Grenfell and Rupert Brooke was directly influenced by their classical studies, and the influence of Greek classicism can be clearly traced in this poem. The fighting man shall from the sun take warmth, and life from the glowing earth, speed with the light-foot winds to run, and with the trees to newer birth, and find when fighting shall be done great rest and fullness after dearth. And when the burning moment breaks, and all things else are out of mind, and only joy of battle takes him by the throat and makes him blind, through joy and blindness he shall know, not caring much to know, that still nor lead nor steel shall reach him, so that it be not the destined will. The thundering line of battle stands, and in the air death moans and sings, but day shall clasp him with strong hands and night shall fold him in soft wings. Uh, the popular conception is uh, that all of the great poets of World War I were anti-war in their sentiments. In actual fact, uh, this view is very far from the truth. Like many of the poets of the trenches, uh, John McRae was concerned not so much with the futility of so many deaths, but with the possibility that their fatal struggles might be betrayed by those tempted to make the peace, uh, which later poets, such as Owen and Sassoon, were to come to value so highly. Uh, despite the scale of the slaughter which he had witnessed, Macrae firmly believed in the war's objectives. In Flanders' fields the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place, and in the sky the lark still bravely singing fly scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders' fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders' fields. Charles Sawley was killed earlier in the war. In contrast to the dead in Macrae's poem, who urges to fight on for their sake, the dead in Sawley's work stay dead. This surely must rank as the bleakest vision to emerge from the whole war. One by one, all of the usual comforts which we use to shield ourselves from the reality of death are swept aside to produce a desolate vision of terrifying finality. Uh, this is the work of a man who has surely seen too much killing. When you see millions of the mouthless dead across your dreams in pale battalions go, say not soft things, as other men have said, that you remember, for you need not so. Give them not praise, for death, how should they know it is not curses heaped upon each gashed head, nor tears, 
Their blind eyes see not your tears flow, nor honour. It is easy to be dead. Say only this, they are dead. Then add thereto, yet many a better one has died before. Then scanning all the overcrowded mass, should you perceive one face that you loved heretofore, it is a spook. None wears a face you knew. Great death has made all his for evermore. The poetry of Sawley and Macrae embodies the spirit of two very different trends of First World War poetry. But many more poets tried to put the experience of that war into verse. The poetry which was to follow Sawley was verse written under fire or during the long tortured hours before the order to uh, go over the top. Words scribbled onto filthy scraps of paper, onto anything that uh, would hold them. Who can tell how many great poems may have been lost, shot down with their young authors somewhere in no man's land? Isaac Rosenberg was both a poet and painter, and he's chiefly remembered for his vivid descriptions of life in the trenches. He, like so many others, was killed during the war itself. Before he died, he wrote these profound lines inspired by a rat which danced across his hand one morning in the trenches. The darkness crumbles away. It's the same old druid time as ever. Only a live thing leaps my hand, a queer sardonic rat, as I pull the parapet's poppy to stick behind my ear. Droll rat. They would shoot you if they knew your cosmopolitan sympathies. Now you have touched this English hand, you will do the same to a German soon, no doubt, if it be your pleasure to cross the sleeping green between. It seems you inwardly grin as you pass strong eyes, fine limbs, haughty athletes, less chance than you for life, bonds to the whim of murder sprawled in the bowels of the earth, the torn fields of France. What do you see in our eyes? and the shrieking iron and flame hurled through the still heavens. What quaver, what heart aghast! Poppies whose roots are in man's veins drop and are ever dropping, but mine in my ear is safe, just a little white with the dust. It's important to distinguish between the two phases of the poetry of the Great War. Most of the British poets we associate with the years 1914-1915 had had a public school education, and this, more than any other factor, um, distinguishes them from those we associate with the second phase, the poets whose writings come from the, the later years of the war. In the poems of 1914-1915, you'll find the word, the word sword, legion, shield, cropping up again and again and again. What you will not find are bullets, bayonets, guns. By the end of 1915, Brooke, Sawley and countless other poets from the public schools were dead. The poets who followed Sawley and Sassoon, um, Wilfred Owen, Isaac Rosenberg, uh, Ivor Gurney, um, came from much less privileged backgrounds. They were not steeped in the classics. They had no chivalric conventions to reject. They went to war, as Whitman had done in the American Civil War, with no Homeric expectations at all, and set themselves to expose what Wilfred Owen called the old lie, dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. It is uh, sweet and fitting to die for one's country. That said, one must avoid the facile and false contrast too often made between the early poems of the first wave of poets and the later poems of the second wave. In 1914, Wilfred Owen wrote um, a quite dreadful poem containing the lines, O meet it is and passing sweet to die in war for others which um, is a great deal worse than anything Rupert Brooke was writing in 1914 and enshrines the sentiments that he was himself to reject 
in his famous poem uh, Dulce et Decorum Est. And in the same year, 1914, Isaac Rosenberg wrote a poem called On Receiving News of the War, which ends with this stanza. O ancient crimson curse, corrode, consume. Give back this universe its pristine bloom. Isaac Rosenberg, who we think of rightly as one of those who understood the natures of, nature of war and wrote about it with, with proper uh, accuracy and indignation, in 1914 saw the war as some sort of cleansing or purgatorial stage which would strip away the false veneer and, and leave civilization a great deal better than it had been before. Wilfred Owen was perhaps the most tragic of the war poets. The sense of despair and futility that pervaded most of the poetry of the Great War reached its peak in Owen's work. Ironically, Owen's sense of doom and the futility of the loss did not deter him from seeking to participate in the war. He was sent home, but he decided to go back to the front, back to the landscape of despair he was describing so vividly. Halted against the shade of a last hill, they fed, and lying easy were at ease, and finding comfortable chests and knees, carelessly slept. But some there stood still to face the stark, blank sky beyond the ridge, knowing their feet had come to the end of the world. Marvelling they stood, and watched the long grass, swirled by the May breeze, murmurous with wasp and midge. For though the summer oozed into their veins, like the injected drug for their bones' pains, sharp on their souls hung the imminent line of grass. Fearfully flashed the sky's mysterious glass. Hour after hour, they ponder the warm field and the far valley behind, where the buttercups had blessed with gold their slow boots coming up, where even the little brambles would not yield, but clutched and clung to them like sorrowing hands. They breathe like trees, unstirred, till like a cold gust thrilled the little word at which each body and its soul be gird and tighten them for battle. No alarms of bugles, no high flags, no clamorous haste, only a lift and flare of eyes to face the sun like a friend with whom their love is done. O oh, larger shone that smile against the sun, mightier than his whose bounty these have spurned. So soon they topped the hill and raced together over an open stretch of herb and heather. Exposed! And instantly the whole sky burned with fury against them. And soft, sudden cups opened in thousands for their blood. And the green slopes chasmed and steepened sheer to infinite space. Of them who, running on that last high place, leapt to swift unseen bullets, or went up on the hot blast and fury of hell's upsurge, or plunged and fell away past this world's verge. Some say God caught them even before they fell. But what say such? as from existence brink, ventured, but drave too swift to sink, the few who rushed in the body to enter hell, and there outfiending all its fiends and flames with superhuman inhumanities, long famous glories, immemorial shames, and crawling slowly back have by degrees regained cool, peaceful air in wonder, why speak they not of comrades that went under? Unlike the victims of his poetry, Owen took up arms again, but tragically he was killed only a week before Armistice Day on the 4th of November, 1918. 
The other great anti-war poet to emerge from the Great War was Siegfried Sassoon, who left us these magnificent examples of what war really means in human terms. The bishop tells us, When the boys come back, they will not be the same, for they'll have fought in a just cause. They lead the last attack on Antichrist. Their comrades' blood has bought new right to breed an honourable race. They have challenged death and dared him face to face. We're none of us the same, the boys reply, for George lost both his legs and Bill stone blind. Poor Jim shot through the lungs and liked to die and Bert's gone syphilitic. You'll not find a chap who served that hasn't found some change. And the bishop said, The ways of God are strange. The poetry of Owen and Sassoon is perhaps the most famous of the war, uh, but other poets, not so well known, also created powerful examples of the genre. The cherry trees bend over and are shedding on the old road where all that passed are dead, their petals strewing the grass as for a wedding this early May morn when there is none to wed. The harrowing black and white images from the trenches, combined with the words of the war poets, will ensure that the experience of World War I is never forgotten. Even later generations of poets seem to live under the shadow of the First World War. Often when a poet writes about war, it is almost inevitably the Great War. Modern poets, it seems, will never be able to shake off the images of that war. Uh, they have seeped into the literary imagination. And like those persistent poppies in Flanders, uh, they will continue to flourish. From a faded photograph, uh, the British poet laureate, Ted Hughes, began to try to understand the horror of what it must have been like to be a young man caught up in the tragedy of the Great War. Hughes, uh, like most of us today, was not of the Great War generation but his family had been touched by the tragedy of losing uncles and husbands in the war. Uh, but Hughes himself had only the photographic evidence of the young men, for whom the future was an uncertain prospect. His use of the Great War as a starting point for his poem confirms just how powerful that conflict was, uh, not just in political or human terms, uh, but in literary terms too. The celluloid of a photograph holds them well. Six young men, familiar to their friends. Four decades that have faded and ochre-tinged this photograph have not wrinkled the faces or the hands. Though their cocked hats are not now fashionable, their shoes shine. One imparts an intimate smile. One chews a grass. One lowers his eyes, bashful. One is ridiculous with cocky pride. Six months after this picture, they were all dead. Uh, this final poem was written after Owen had witnessed the horrific effects of a gas attack. The old lie, of course, is that war is a glorious exercise, that war is anything but a tangled horror of blood and death. The old lie, as Owen so memorably put it in uh, Dulce et Decorum Est, is that falling in battle is sweet and noble and a worthwhile thing to do in itself. The Latin lines which close the poem can be translated as it is sweet and right to die for your country. With this poem, Owen convinces us beyond all doubt of the hollowness of that lie. Gas! Gas! Quick, boys! An ecstasy, a fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea, I saw him drowning in all my dreams before my helpless sight. He plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face, like a devil's, sick of sin. If you could hear, at every 
jolt, the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud, a vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues? My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mor.